Hi, everybody. Welcome to CN Live here on NRA TV. I'm Bill Little sitting in for Coley Noir. I think he's back on Wednesday, I think. But even though the chair may be empty, the world continues to spin around. And more and more often, we find these stories are just getting more and more alarming. Although we have to say we've had a pretty good year so far and um, the situation for the gun scene is certainly improving. With that said, why don't we go right away and just get right into it. We've got a lot of a uh, report to come for you from uh, Paris, France. So let's go ahead and talk to our friend uh, Chuck Holton, who's been there for a while. Chuck, you there? I'm Can you here, hear me? Bill. How are you? I'm well. Um, we spoke to you from Paris last week and then you were in Sweden and then somewhere else. Were you on Iwo Jima? Did I hear that right? No, I'm headed to Iwo Jima right now. I'm actually. That's someplace I've always wanted to go. The airports. So, Chuck, let me ask you about this. Um, we we've, we've been looking at uh, Europe as a sort of a, you know, canary in the coal mine for America in terms of so many things, with socialist policies and 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 all of this stuff. But obviously, the one thing I think most Americans are concerned about right now is the idea of, uh, you know, huge amounts of, of uh, Muslim immigration into Europe. There was a town I remember hearing uh, in Germany that had 150 native Germans in it, and the government put in 400 Syrian refugees, and it's turning the whole whole of Europe is being turned upside down. What is the sense you get from the people on the streets? Well, uh, the sense I get... So the people, they, they've reached a tipping point in, in uh, France especially, uh, which has brought in the largest number of uh, Muslim immigrants uh, than any other country in Europe per capita. And uh, the, they're saying that these immigrants have no intention of becoming French, have no intention of ever uh, accepting European culture. And, you know, we've been talking about this with uh Grant Stinchfield over on NRA TV quite a bit that, you know, when you bring people from a completely lawless nation where their worldview is really almost diametrically opposed to ours or to the Western worldview, even though France is a very secular country, uh, it still is benefiting from the, um, I guess you would say that the do unto others as you'd have them do unto you, Judeo-Christian mm -hmm. worldview that that kind of helped found Europe. And uh, we, we see the same thing in our country. But you're you're going from a, uh, you know, golden rule kind of society in France, and you're bringing people in, in their tens and hundreds of thousands that mm -hmm. come from a, a, a worldview that's very different. Their, their worldview is more do unto others before they do unto you. Uh, yeah, you know, take right. from him before he takes from you, that sort of thing. That's right. Uh, Western culture is pretty much a trust-based culture where the relationships are based on trust, and we assume that people are going to do the right thing. And if not, then there's some kind of rule of law to keep them in line. But in um, many Muslim countries, it's more of a dominance-based culture. If somebody's my That's boss, right. I'm boss of somebody else, and all this stuff kind of rolls downhill. Don't you find it a little more than a little annoying to hear um, refugees who've been basically given their lives through the generosity of the French government or the German government or whatever. It's it's insulting. I think it's deadly insulting to say, oh, yes, well, we're going to come to, to France, but we're not going to become French. Well, you know, they're coming from a worldview that's that's not compatible with French culture, really. And, uh, you know, so I guess you can't really expect them to. One of the things that we've been talking about quite a bit is just how the the pull factor i've been reporting on this for uh, almost 10 years now on the on the immigration issue and you know these people are coming from war torn terribly poor areas and so that's a push factor but we have to talk about the pull factor and that is mm -hmm. the question why aren't they going to saudi arabia for example yeah why aren't they going to to a place that is more compatible with their worldview well the reason is because of these ridiculously generous welfare systems that the Western cultures have put into place. And, and that's pulling them to to Europe and to the United States. And, you know, these people are going from making a dollar a day or less to making maybe twelve hundred to sixteen hundred dollars a month. Yep. It's like winning the lottery for them. And, and yeah. And speaking, I, speaking of the lottery, Chuck, I've seen I've seen video of, of some of these um, immigrants basically sitting under trees and discussing whether it be better to go to Germany or whether Norway is going to be better in terms of the benefits, how much free money we get and so on. But I have to tell you, again, it's just this 
there are two things about this that puzzle me on on the big picture. Maybe we could address both of them. You mentioned the benefits. So this idea that there's a sort of ingratitude for all of the aid and the assistance that they're getting really bothers me. But here's something that you could maybe address for me, Chuck. We're told about all of these horrors that these immigrants, um, these migrants are, are escaping, uh, refugees, uh, are going through back home. But they almost all seem to be military-aged men. And for people like you and me, we're not going to leave wives and mothers and daughters uh, and young boys and old men in a war zone. We're going to get them out first. It seems a little odd to me that all of these strong young men were the ones to make it out. And, and what happened to their families? How, did, how could they possibly leave those people behind? Well, again, you're going back to that worldview issue, that, that foundational precept of their worldview, which is not give, you know, love your neighbor, okay? It's, it's take from your neighbor. And, you know, when you look at the totem pole of uh, human value in their, in their value system, women and children are at the bottom of the list. They're not at the top of the list. And uh, one of the things that a lot of, you'll hear a lot of liberals say is that the journey is so arduous that these people decided to come and establish a foothold and later on they would bring their women and children over. There, there is undoubtedly some of that. However, I asked these people point blank, people from Syria, people from Somalia, uh, people from uh, Afghanistan, Nepal, you know, some of these very Muslim countries and asked them, where are your women? Uh, you know, you're all military age males here. Where are your women? Did you, are they hiding at home or, or what? And they said, no, no, we, we don't have women. We're, we're going to get women here. We yeah. plan to get women yeah. here in Europe. But That's because right. of the sexual big, politics difference, they, they don't know how to do that. Yeah, it's a big Disney World trip for them. You know, they're going to get um, they're going to get the little hats and they're going to get all the candy bags and everything they want when they get here. And um, I don't know. I don't know how you feel about it. I don't know how the average Frenchman or woman feels about it. But to me, this lack of gratitude, this this horrible attitude, this sense of, well, we're going to leave our women and children behind. We've got some French women over there or some uh, Swedish women over there. And we'll we'll you know, we'll nab a couple of those. And what's the best possible benefits we can have? These are not right. the kind of people that you want in a country. These are not people who came like regular immigrants came to America, for example. If an Italian family came to America at the turn of the last century, around 1900, the parents would insist that the children speak only English. They would try to make their kids more American than the Americans. They would work right. very, very hard and, and try to bring a good name to themselves and to their, and to their ethnicity as, as guests in America. And we don't see any of this from this wave of uh, Muslim right. immigrants. I, I, none. Well, you don't. And, Bill, you can't expect an Afghan not to act like an Afghan, not to have no, an no. Afghan worldview. But what no, I'm saying is it, 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 there's a deeper level here. And the fault or, you know, the, the blame for this lies at the feet of the liberals, because what That's happens it. is, you, look, if, if you're in trouble and you're in need and I see that and I open my wallet and, and help you, that is a, an act of charity that creates gratitude on your part because you know that I'm a human being like you are and you, you're grateful for the help. But when these liberals try to step between you and me and take from me uh, at the point of a gun, essentially, uh, yeah. through taxes and say, you didn't earn that and then give to you. Now you're receiving help, not from an individual, not from another person like you, but you're receiving help from an impersonal organization. And that impersonal organization can print money, by the way. And mm -hmm. so they instead, you know, if they got six hundred dollars, they have every reason to say, oh, why wasn't it eight hundred dollars? And yeah, that's, that's right. why and you that, see these guys right. saying, maybe we should go to Norway instead of uh, Germany or whatever, because they're just looking for the biggest payout. And Thank and you. what that creates, and I've seen this all over the world, uh, what that creates is not gratitude. It creates resentment. And, and exactly. I don't blame the Afghans for, for, for doing it. I don't, I don't blame the Somalis for coming there because, hey, if somebody's handing out free cookies, I'm going to get in line. But what I blame is the social programs, the people that put these in place and think that that uh, coercion through taxation and, and giving somebody money through the state equals charity. It does not. And it actually perverts the whole magic of charity. And that's why when you go to places like Kenya, you'll see uh, an enormous slum surrounding the World Food Program headquarters. But it's not because they decided that was a good place to put the headquarters. The headquarters was there first, and the slum built up around it, and they ended up 
uh, becoming a self-fulfilling prophecy. They ended up creating yeah. the very problem that they meant to address. Chuck, we're, um, we're going to come back talk to you some more after the break, uh, but this is, in fact, in my opinion, this is the single fault line that runs through the human heart, is the sense that um, when people do great favors, we just get cynical and we say no good deed goes unpunished. But basically what happens is when people help people, the people who have received the help, very often, if it's just a gift, especially an impersonal gift from something like the government, then they not only are not grateful, but they're they're envious and they're and they're uh, you know filled with resentment. kind of resentment. Like, how come I didn't get more? Okay, we'll get to that when we come back. We're about to go to a break here, but um, we really do have a problem with this issue, and it's something we're all going to have to look at very seriously because it's not producing. Uh, it's, we're not in it for the gratitude, but it's not producing any kind of a sense from the people who are helping that 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 should stop. Like. Well, we'll be back in just a few minutes. We'll continue our talk with our friend uh, Chuck Holton over in Paris. This is Bill Little sitting in for Colin Noir, and this is CN Live on NRA TV. <laughs> <laughs> 